Alabama-based reporter Ben Rains had been looking for a particular shipwreck for several months, a notorious vessel which had been scuppered and burned in 1860. Indeed, this was a ship that came with a shocking history attached. Then on New Year's Day 2018, Rains found some charred and rotting timbers in the Mobile Tensaw Delta, just inland from the Alabama coastline. It looked like the 48-year-old from Fairhope, Alabama might have stumbled across the relic that he'd been looking for. And furthermore, it appeared that he had uncovered a direct link with a wicked and troubled past. Ben Rains is an investigative environmental journalist for AI.com, a current affairs website which reports on all things Alabama. But the reporter is also a boat captain, and that was obviously a big help when he was searching for his 19th century wreck. Rains was more than familiar with the meandering creeks and lazy bayous that drain into the Mobile River just north of the city with the same name. In his role as an environmental reporter, Bain's interest was usually restricted to the area's flora and fauna, but a strange tale had made him raise his sights. A local man had told the journalist a shameful story of a ship scuppered thereabouts. And so, in 2017, Rains found himself hunting for the wreck of the Clotilda. By all accounts, this boat had an extraordinary and horrifying past. In fact, it was said to be the very last vessel known to have kidnapped Africans and transported them to the U.S. as slaves. And the most shocking element of Clotilda's terrible tale was that the man who planned and organized her vile voyage did so for a bet. The 19th century Alabama landowner who had accepted this wicked wager that he could smuggle a cargo of abducted Africans into Mobile, Alabama was one Timothy Meir, and the crucial part of the $100,000 bet made in 1858 was that Meir could achieve this feat within two years without attracting the attention of the authorities. Note that Mir's strategy had to have been successfully executed by 1860 for him to win the wager. While slavery in the U.S. had not been banned by that point, it had been against the law to bring new slaves into the country since 1808. To this end, there were two forts full of federal officers stationed at the mouth of the Mobile River, and these troops would have been more than happy to apprehend anyone they caught trying to import slaves. In actual fact, Mir was a wealthy plantation owner with no financial need to engage in the slave trade or indeed to have accepted a challenge for cash from a northern industrialist. Nevertheless, driven on by the bet that he'd made, Near paid $35,000 for the Clotilda, a two-masted schooner built in 1855. Conveniently enough, the 86-foot ship came with the seafaring services of its seller, Captain William Foster of Mobile. In early 1860, with the clock on his bet fast running down, Meir gave Foster some gold bullion worth $9,000, a princely sum in the mid-19th century. It was the equivalent of almost $260,000 today. Foster was instructed to buy 100 slaves from what was then known as Dahomey, known these days as Benin, on the west coast of Africa. In the event, Foster had an eye for a bargain and managed to stretch the gold to purchase 110 of his fellow human beings. The Clotilda's return journey to Mobile from Dahomey took about four months. It was by all accounts an eventful trip, with Captain Foster prevailing against a crew mutiny. In addition, the schooner survived the loss of a mast during a storm as well as an attack from a hostile Portuguese ship. Nonetheless, the vessel made it back to Alabama with its human cargo intact. Mercifully, none of the hundred slaves had been killed in the process. But Mir and Foster well understood the risks they were taking with their illegal enterprise, the death penalty. Consequently, the plan was that the Clotilda would land well away from Mobile at Point O'Pins, a lonely spot on the Mississippi Sound. Once there, the ship would unload its slaves before sailing to Mexico for a quick makeover and change of identity to leave no evidence in its wake. But before the landing could take place, Mir got wind that word of his nefarious scheme had gotten out. In something of a panic and with the Clotilda's crew voicing their discontent once again, the conspirators changed their plan. Mir and Foster decided to bring the ship inland and set it ablaze to remove the evidence of their misdeeds. Foster described what happened next in his journal, which was quoted from by AI.com in a report from January of 2018. The ship's captain wrote, I towed the Clotilda into Mobile Bay and up to 12 Mile Island and transferred the captives to a river steamboat, the Tsar, and then I burned the Clotilda and sunk her in 20 feet of water. And this was exciting testimony. The reference to 12 Mile Island appeared to crucially link Ben Rain's discovery at the beginning of January 2018 to the Clotilda from 1860. The journalist's wreck was located on the banks of that same island, 
which lies just downstream from the confluence of the Mobile River and Bayou Cano. And rains could point to more evidence to support the claim that his wreck was the remains of La Clotilda. Charring visible on some of the ship's timbers indicated that they must have been burned, just as Captain Foster's vessel had been. Nonetheless, to get the story straight, Raines now brought on board two renowned archaeologists. These were professors Greg Cook and John Bratton from the University of West Florida. Both academics who had been well immersed in historical shipwrecks off the coast of the U.S. and Africa took up Raines' invitation to visit the 12-mile island wreck. Quoted by AI.com in response to the idea that it may have been the Clotilda, Cook told Raines, You can definitely say maybe and maybe even a little bit stronger. Because the location is right, the construction seems to be right from the proper time period, and it appears to be burnt, so I'd say very compelling for sure. Bratton was also cautiously positive about the positive identity of the wreck. There's nothing here to say this isn't the Clotilda, and several things that say it might be, he told Raines. As the journalist next recruited the services of Winthrop Turner, a local shipbuilder, to help with confirming the age of the wrecked vessel, he explained to AI.com, these ships were the 18-wheelers of their day. They were designed to haul a huge amount of cargo in relatively shallow water. Turner, who has particular expertise in wooden ships, visited 12 Mile Island, and the Mobile shipwright subsequently told Raines, the construction techniques here, no threaded bolts, iron drifts, butt jointed planking, these all confirm a ship built between 1850 and 1880. So it appeared that the wreck was the right age to indicate it could be the Clotilda. But this left 110 humans, the people abducted from Dahomey and transported across the Atlantic against their will, in limbo. It's thought that most of these unfortunates were Tarkbar people who had been captured in what is now modern-day Gahana. After disembarking from the Clotilda, the slaves were shared out among those who invested in the illegal enterprise, with Mir keeping 30 for himself. Nevertheless, it turned out that history was on the African side. The year 1865 saw the American Civil War come to an end and slavery abolished, thanks to the 13th Amendment. So the Clotilda slaves were thankfully all freed just five years after they had been abducted. Some of them grouped together to buy a piece of land and named it Africatown. Located three miles north of downtown Mobile, the settlement still exists, and some descendants of the Clotilda's cargo are still proud to call it home. In fact, the last of those that made the illegal journey across the Atlantic, Cujo Kazula Lewis, died in Africatown in 1935. So Rains would have to continue exploring the 12-mile island shipwreck without the benefit of a first-hand witness, but he was also hampered in this endeavor by red tape. Rains had been unable to excavate around the wreck simply because he didn't possess the proper paperwork in order to do so. As a consequence, any historical evaluations had to be done by sight alone. However, archaeologists Cook and Bratton emphasized the fact that they could make no definite conclusions as to the identity of the wreck without a much more thorough examination. Nevertheless, in March of 2018, Rains had secured the requisite permits. A 12-strong team of University of West Florida researchers, some equipped with scuba diving gear, were now able to give the wreck much more scrutiny. Alas, this revealed a disappointing truth. Digging beneath the mud, the team discovered that this particular 12-mile island shipwreck the team discovered that this particular 12-mile island shipwreck was, in fact, much larger than historical records show the Clotilda had been. Named ironically after the French patron saint of exiles, the Clotilda still harbors its final resting place from history.